Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the dissertation defense of Shannon Cook. We are uh, really delighted, very proud of everything that Shannon has achieved so far. She's actually off to sail the big seas and she's headed to be a, uh, a big scientist now. So she's actually moving on to her own faculty position at Augustana College in South Dakota. Uh, so we want to congratulate her. It's actually quite a luxury to have a job in the uh, So Shannon came to us in uh, us in the University of Merced, California, Merced, uh, College of Information Sciences. Um, in 2018 uh, from the University of Edinburgh, uh, where she um, worked on issues related to philosophy of mind, specifically on you know, inactive and embodied cognition. And before that, um, she actually she has a background in, in music, she has a degree in music from uh, Notre Dame and University. Uh, and so she came to us with this unique skill set, um, philosophy of mind and body cognition, as well as um, music. And she wanted to carve a unique path for herself going forward, uh, blending her background with more analytic neuroscience and computational approaches that uh, UC Merced is known for. And she's done that uh, with style over the last four years. Uh, she's been uh, an, an integral part of the UC Merced travel plan community. She's worked very hard to make our campus climate better. She's been an extraordinary participant in issues relating to equity, diversity, and inclusion to make our university a fairer place. And she's been an amazing contributor to our lab. You can see from her publication list that she's actually done an enormous amount of work. So today is a celebration of everything Shannon. She is gonna present her dissertation, um, which is, um, spans four chapters, correct? Five, five, five yeah. chapters. Um, I've read them all. I'm a co-author of all of so yeah, I kind of have read them all. Um, and um, she will condense her work and present uh, highlights of it um, in a talk that will span about 15 minutes to an hour. Um, and during this time, please, uh, we will restrict ourselves to questions uh, of clarification only. And then once that part of the talk is done, um, we will open uh, the, the session up for a Q&A with uh, people in the audience, uh, any member of the, the audience here at the gallery, as well as people on Zoom uh, can ask questions. And we hope that this would, the cycle would run for about 15 or 20 minutes, which time we will ask everyone that is not in um, Shannon's committee, which is uh, Professor Chris Kello, uh, and Dr. Christina Backer, who's actually joining us on Zoom and myself, Except for the, the three of us and Shannon, everybody else will be asked to leave the room. Uh, and we will do our special lines of investigating mm -hmm. and secret questions that we ask. And then <laughs> at the end of which, there will be a secret handshake that Shannon will learn. And then she'll be a member <laughs> of the Freemason Society. <laughs> um, so, no, there, there are no secrets. Um, but at the end of it, um, Shannon will be refused from the room. The committee will deliberate and then uh, make its announcement. You'll see white smoke coming from the <laughs> uh, which means Shannon has got a PhD. Um, so, with that as the backdrop, um, I want to thank um, Shannon's committee once again, Dr. Costello, Dr. Christina Backer, uh, all of Shannon's collaborators. There are many of you in this room. Um, uh, and people who've come from far away, Shannon's family. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jessica Ross, thank you for joining us. She's, she's come all the way from Stanford today. Um, many of our members of the CIS community who are here today, uh, and Shannon's bestie, Marley. Uh, <laughs> everybody's here. So, Shannon, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. All right. Um, just to check, can everyone online hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Okay. So you can interact in the chat as much as you want from this moment on. I'm uh, minimizing it so it won't um, be distracting here. And then we'll get started. Zoom has too many controls. Okay. Um, so rhythms at small and large scales. This is what we'll be talking about today. Um, but before we get started uh, with talking about my research, I wanted to take some time to thank some people. Um, some of you are here right now in this room or on Zoom, um, my committee, uh, Christina, Chris, and my advisor, Ramesh, of course. Um, I also need to thank my lab mates, um, who most of whom are pictured here, 
um, for always uh, supporting me in these last four years and my intrepid undergraduate RAs in those last couple of pictures, um, research assistants without whom these projects would not have been completed. And I also wanna thank um, the department. This is only some of you um, in one of our lunches over the pandemic. Um, it was actually really great going through a horrible time with all of you because um, we were all really close and supported each other, even though we were all so far away. Um, and then of course my family um, for supporting me for all of these years, no matter how annoying I could be. Um, and I skipped everyone in the NRT. I, I'm so sorry. Everyone in the NRT programs, these are pictures from our retreat. Um, the conversations with all of you have been invaluable. Um, and finally, uh, the funders. So the University of California Merced, who has funded um, some of my research here and the National Science Foundation, um, who funded me through um, a national research traineeship in intelligent adaptive systems, and then also a semester of interdisciplinary computational um, graduate education. All right, now that's out of the way, let's get to the content. So every day we come into contact with a barrage of sensory information. And to cope with this sensory barrage, our brains and our bodies are involved in constant game of prediction and coordination. We've developed certain expectancies about how the world works. We have expectancies about sensory information will unfold, how the sights that we see and the sounds that we hear um, will change over time. We have expectancies about how social information or the behavior of other people will unfold around us. And we also have expectancies about how we will interact with this sensory information and the social environment. When we are alone, um, even when we're alone, listening to maybe our personalized Spotify playlist or we're hearing a new song for the first time, our brains are attuned to the melodic and rhythmic content of the song. We're predicting not only what the next note might be, but also when the next beat might fall. When we interact with other people, we're coordinating and adapting the rhythm of our shared behavior. Uh, we coordinate the rhythms of a dialogue during a ca casual conversation. We coordinate uh, the rhythms of a crowd when we synchronize our speech while we're cheering on our favorite sports team. And we coordinate the rhythms of multiple melodic and harmonic voices when we make music together. These rhythms span multiple scales and modalities. We have cortical and subcortical networks in our brain, um, which are coordinating to process visual, auditory, and other sensory information as we move our bodies to speak, to gesture, and to coordinate our behavior with another person or with an entire crowd of people. Rhythms at small and at large scales has been the central theme of much of my PhD work, including collaborations across labs and departments here at UC Merced, as well as national and international collaborations across disciplines and institutions. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the small subset of this research, which was included in my PhD dissertation. We're gonna talk about uh, the neural mechanisms of beat and rhythm perception. And then we're going to transition into talking about the recurrence dynamics or the rhythms of large group interaction. And to set the stage so that it doesn't just sound like a lot of words and vocabulary for you, I'm going to start by showing you a brief video. Um, and this is a video of American singer, Bobby McFerrin, who is demonstrating expectations and the power of the pentatonic scale at the World Science Festival in 2009. Um, when I click play, the first few seconds are very loud, um, but then it'll, it'll get soft after that. Talking about expectations, expectations. Watch. Ba, 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 ba,
Um, the end there. Uh, so what did we see? What, what was the purpose of showing this video this morning on this day? Um, so um, if we were singing along, uh, you would have experienced the same thing that the audience was experiencing um, at that event. And that is that as you were singing, um, the audience was able to sing every note um, that Bobby McFerrin gave them, even when he stopped singing and when the audience did not know what note was going to happen ahead of time. Um, and we haven't sung that specific pattern of notes in that specific way before. Um, the reason this happens is that our brains have actually built a predictive model around this pentatonic scale here. And this pentatonic scale, it's found in many cultures around the world. Um, it's a pervasive um, pattern of, of pitches. And so we all actually have a pretty stable model of the scale and what it would sound like, even if we don't have any formal musical training or if you've never heard the term pentatonic before in your life until this very day. Um, and what's more, what'll be important later in the talk is the audience actually began to coordinate together as they were singing. So they were all attending this, you know, as individuals, maybe they're all interested in what was going on on the stage at this conference, um, but they weren't interacting as a group until they began singing and coordinating in this demonstration here. Um, so I want to draw your attention to the fact um, that we were not able just to sing the correct pitch, which is pretty impressive, but we were also able to sing in time with McFerrin. You may have even found yourself tapping your foot. You might've been gently moving to the beat of the music. Um, and this is related to a phenomenon called musical groove, which is our drive to move along to music um, or move along to rhythms with the beat. And humans are really good at moving to music and really good at moving to rhythmic beats. In fact, our brains are modeling um, a predictive model of the beats and the rhythms that we hear, just as we're modeling a predictive model of the scales that we hear. And the movement of our bodies helps us predict when the next beat will happen and um, to predict how that rhythm will unfold over time. And this is actually a really impressive skill that humans have. Um, this drive to move in time to music has been found only in a few other animals. Um, and some notable examples are Ronan the sea lion who bobs her head to the Backstreet Boys and Snowball the cockatoo who has an entire repertoire of dance moves. Interestingly, moving to music or a beat, um, it's not actually found in our closest primate relatives. So chimpanzees, bonobos, macaques, they share many traits with us, um, but music or moving in time to rhythmic stimuli is not one of those strongly shared traits. Sea lions and cockatoos, however, they have um, a, a skill that they share with humans. This skill is called vocal learning. And this means that these animals can hear a sound made from a conspecific, another member of their species, and they can learn how to produce that sound with their own vocal cords. And they can also hear the sounds that they're making and learn from feedback from their own voice and their conspecifics, how to change these sounds to make the right sounds. And this is actually very important um, for humans in order for us to learn language and to develop language abilities, speaking language abilities. And this ability actually requires um, very tight, very um, strong communication between motor areas of your brain that are controlling your vocal cords and fine motor movements of your articulatory apparatus, your tongue, your lips, how they move. Um, and then the auditory areas of your brain, which are hearing these sounds and processing this feedback, whether this is the right sound or not. And this tight connection between auditory, auditory and motor areas of the brain um, has been proposed as a possible mechanism for the evolution of beat perception, our ability to perceive and um, move to a beat in music. And the importance of this auditory motor link is spelled out more specifically in the action simulation for auditory prediction hypothesis. 
Um, so vocal learning may have actually been what enhanced connections between auditory and motor areas in the brain um, via this dorsal auditory pathway that you see here. And now the motor cortex is very adept at, periodic, at predicting periodic events. Um, if you think about just, just everywhere that you walk every day, this is a constant periodic motion of uh, your feet in time. And rhythm and music often follows a similar periodic structure. So when we hear rhythms, um, the motor system might uh, simulate something like periodic movement, which then helps the auditory system uh, predict the beats and patterns within that rhythm. And this communication between the auditory and motor cortex is actually facilitated by a region of your brain, just slightly posterior, called the um, parietal cortex, um, which is dealing with sensory integration as we're communicating across sensory modalities here. Um, however, I mentioned earlier that uh, bonobos, chimpanzees, our primate relatives, um, lack beat perception, but they don't completely lack beat perception. After all, many primates engage in group drumming um, behaviors, and some bonobos have actually been trained to tap along to a beat, and a chimpanzee has controversially been shown to sway to the beat of music. Um, so there is some evidence that uh, in uh, rhesus macaques, actually, that the neural mechanisms um, sensitive to beat perception in humans are maybe also sensitive to the regularity of beats in a rhythmic stimulus, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But given that there's at least some rudimentary rhythmic abilities in some primates, um, there was another hypothesis proposed in the exact same year as ASAP, and that's the gradual audio motor evolution hypothesis. And you'll notice that both of these diagrams highlight a very similar pathway in the brain. It's highlighting the dorsal auditory, dorsal auditory pathway um, and communications between auditory and motor areas. The parietal cortex here is a very important part of this pathway. Um, and GAE over here also explicitly mentions some very important subcortical structures that are involved in beat and rhythm perception. And the most important distinction between these two hypotheses here is not necessarily the specific pathways that are involved, um, but it's rather a theor theoretical one. So where ASAP relies a lot on vocal learning, and maybe that's the mechanism to explain these tight auditory motor connections, um, GAE poses that these tight connections may have evolved um, more gradually um, before and then after the split between our close primate relatives. So now that you have some background on beat perception and what pathways the brain use to predict and perceive rhythms, I'm going to introduce you how we might test specifically for predictive processes that are happening in the brain during beat and rhythm perception. And to do this, I use a tool called um, electroencephalography, EEG, and we measure how the signals in your brain change over time. So when we want to evaluate whether or not um, your brain is making predictions about a pattern of sensations, it could be patterns of visual inputs, it could be patterns of sound. What we do is we present you with a very stable and consistent pattern, 80% of the time. And while you're listening to this pattern, your brain is able to make a predictive model of the pattern that you're experiencing, or maybe to entrain to the rhythm of a beat. And every once in a while, 20% of the time, uh, we'll change up this pattern. We might change a color or a shape if it's a visual pattern, or we might leave out a note if it's a rhythmic pattern. That change in stimulus is called an oddball or a deviant stimulus. And this deviant stimulus, um, it violates that predictive model. It violates the expectation you have. And we can actually see standard markers of surprise in your brain in the EG signal when um, you come into contact with that deviant stimulus. And today we're gonna focus on only two of these components. The first is a mismatched negativity. And that is a negative peak here that we see between 100 to 200 milliseconds after a deviant stimulus. And this is a pre-attentive response. So you could think of it as your brain being surprised a little bit that that stimulus changed. The next of these components is um, the P3A and it's a slightly later component between two and 300 milliseconds. And this, is a, this component is related to sort of redirecting your attention towards that deviant stimulus. Um, and it might even be indicative a bit of conscious perception of that change in that stimulus. And if we find these signals, oh, it's conscious. So this is when you're aware that you're surprised. So this is you being surprised by this deviant stimulus. Um, and if these signals appear um, when we present you uh, one of these very specific patterns that's 80% predictable, 20% deviance, um, then we can infer that you've developed a predictive model in your brain and that made you sensitive to these deviations. So in our lab here, I put people in an EG cap. This is what that looks like. 
And I actually have a specific set of stimuli um, from some colleagues that we collaborate with at the University of Amsterdam that is designed to elicit a predictive model in the listener. And so it has one of these stimuli that's like 80% predictable pattern. And then every once in a while, something about that pattern has changed. And I have two versions of the stimuli. And before I tell you what they are, or why they're important, I just wanna play them for you. Um, and then just think, do they sound the same or different? Um, and just what do you kind of think about these two sounds? So first, So that's the first sound, it lasts for 10 minutes. If you're in my experiment, you've experienced this before. Um, and here's the second sound. All right, do we have any um, inclinations? Do those sound the same to you? Do they sound different? They definitely sounded different. Thought I might look at the chat if you guys want to participate. You can answer too. Um, was there anything uh, in particular that you noticed about the two sounds that you might want to mention? They're more of a second one. <laughs> <laughs> the second one is worse. Yeah. So Jordan, Jordan, um, for those of you who don't know him, raps and he's fantastic at it. Uh, he said he didn't want to rap to the second one. Um, online, Maya says the second one sounded choppy. Um, Nina says wanted to make sure the second one matched the first, but they did sound a different. Michael said the second one stressed me out. New said, my brain doesn't like the second one. Marley also said that. I'm gonna minimize the chat again. Um, and yeah, so there was definitely a difference. This first sound, it resembles a uh, standard rock beat that you're all familiar with. And this has an isochronous stimulus. So it has regular intervals between each of the beats. And this nice isochronous predictable stimulus um, is really helpful for beat perception because when you have this predictable stimulus and this kind of feeling of a meter, you have strong and weak beats. Um, your brain is able to build a strong predictive model of this rhythm over time. And we expect to see a strong predictive response at deviant moments. The jittered stimulus, um, you can't infer a meter. Um, a lot of you didn't like it. Uh, so I guess it has a little bit of an emotional component too. Um, and, but the pattern of the sounds, the order that the loud and soft sounds appear is the exact same. Um, so your brain might be doing something like sequential learning um, rather than predictive processing here. And just for completeness, here's what that stimuli look like. Um, so this is a visual that was created by um, Flora Bauer and her colleagues at the University of Amsterdam. Oh, I thought that was my sound. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when you see in, in the sound sequence, we have accented beats, um, which are bass drum hits. We have unaccented beats, which are hi-hats. Um, and sometimes these accented beats are most of the time, they always fall on a beat. Sometimes they fall off a beat. Um, and then we have deviants. So that's these uh, orange bars or purple bars. And these deviants in this particular pattern, um, if I kind of zoom in a little bit and circle them, um, are right here. So these are going to be, um, there's no sound at these locations here. It's, it's very, very soft, you can barely hear the sound. Um, and we either just leave out a beat completely when it's on the beat, or we leave out that sound when it's off of the beat. And we look for these, same components here, uh, mismatch negativity or a P3A, sort of our, our pre-attentive um, component or our potentially conscious sort of, sort of post-dictive component um, when we then maybe recognize that the beat um, was left out. And what's um, really interesting about this stimuli and why I chose this particular set of stimuli to use is that it has actually been tested in humans. Um, we found in adult humans, and by we, I mean um, music cognition in general, I didn't do this research, um, but this has been tested in humans. Um, and so we have found uh, strong predictive signals, a strong mismatch activity, a strong P3A, especially in response to on-beat deviance and that nice predictable rhythm. And we've also seen this response in babies. Um, so even um, sort of before you have language or making music of your own, we have this response. But the stimuli has also been tested in monkeys and rhesus macaques that I mentioned briefly um, much earlier. And in rhesus macaques, when they're listening um, to these stimuli, we also see these peaks. We see a very subtle mismatch negativity, uh, pre-attentive component, and we see a very subtle um, post-dictive component, indicating that they might also be sensitive to differences, at least in 
the isochronous rock beat versus that jittered beat um, that a lot of you didn't like, if not as sensitive to um, the actual placement of the beat in rhythm. And um, I tell this all to you because if humans have stronger markers of beat perception than macaques, and humans also have tighter auditory motor connections uh, via this dorsal auditory pathway, um, we might be interested in exactly um, what the causal role is of this pathway in beat perception. And for that, I move on to a procedure that a lot of us use in our lab, and a lot of you have participated in our experience, experiments, um, which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this is a technique where we hold um, a magnet to the scalp, and when we sent a magnetic pulse through that magnet, um, through the scalp, it actually causes changes in electrical activity in your brain. And the form of TMS that we use actually downregulates activity in that target region. Um, so if we have someone in a behavioral experiment or a perceptual experiment, we might um, have them complete the experiment, we'll downregulate an area of the brain that we think is involved in that process, and compare their behavior or their perceptions um, before and after we stimulate their brain. So our um, question, our research question here, is basically if we stimulate regions on that dorsal auditory pathway, um, will our predictive responses that we find in the EEG after TMS maybe look a little bit more like the monkeys? Um, and so we actually target um, two specific regions. Um, one is the posterior parietal cortex, which I mentioned was really important in communicating between auditory motor areas. Um, and the other is the supplementary motor area, which I have not discussed yet, um, but this is a motor area that we find active when we listen to rhythmic stimuli um, in an FRI machine or musical stimuli. So it may also play a role here. So the first thing we did, of course, was we wanna know if we can elicit the same responses in our participants. Um, and yes, we did find markers of prediction in the EEG signal before TMS. So this data I'm showing on the screen is all before we've TMS anyone's brain. We see this pre-intensive mismatch negativity and highlighted in blue is where that activity um, is, is mostly directed from. And then we see that slightly later P3A component when you might be aware that you uh, a deviant has just happened. And that is a, a little bit more central component here on the brain. And this is for that regular rock beat condition. This is where we expect to see the largest um, response to those deviations because you're able to develop a robust, robust predictive model. And then this is for the jittered or rock beat stimulus. So we also see um, a mismatch negativity when a deviant is left out. We see that later P3A component um, when um, also when a beat is left out in the jittered condition. And this indicates maybe there is a little bit of prediction happening here or at least sequential learning, um, maybe. But um, that's not our primary question. So to the two areas of the brain that we simulate. So the supplementary motor area, it's not part of the dorsal auditory stream and the posterior parietal cortex, which is a hub within the dor dorsal auditory stream. So previous research in our lab from Jessica, actually right over here, um, has shown if we downregulate the SMA, um, we don't have a strong effect on behavioral measures of musical beat perception. When we ask people to just tell us whether a metronome beep is in time with a musical signal that they're hearing. But when we stimulate the posterior parietal cortex, we do see an effect on some forms of beat perception um, when we ask them to tell us if that metronome beep is in time with the music. And specifically, um, they have deviations in, uh, they have, um, it's more difficult for them to distinguish um, deviations in beat phase. So what are the results from our study? After stimulation to SMA, um, what we see here um, are the pink amplitudes. So these are the, the values for the pink amplitude, peak amplitudes of um, that predictive component that later maybe conscious component. And before TMS, we see pretty high peak amplitudes, especially for the in red, that isochronous predictable condition. After TMS, um, we see that that red line, it got shifted down. Um, so maybe we are attenuating that P3A response and maybe we are interfering a little bit with the generation of predictive models after we stimulate um, supplementary motor area. And we see relatively little change in the jittered stimulus, um, which indicates that we're likely not interfering with sequential learning. Similarly, after stimulation of the posterior parietal cortex, um, we also see a reduction in this P3A amplitude, which indicates um, that we are interfering with uh, predictive processing, also when we stimulate the LPPC, and slightly less so in the jittered condition.
So what does this mean? Why did I do this experiment? Because um, I want to know if these really are the mechanisms. Um, we know they're different between human and monkeys, and I want to know if they really are involved in bee perception. And we're getting close to answer this question. And this is a subset of the data as I have uh, um, analyzed the rest of the data that hasn't been included in my dissertation yet, um, the answer to this question will become more apparent. So we've been discussing um, the role of rhythm in music, uh, whether or not animals share rhythmic abilities, and we've explored a possible neural mechanism um, for why rhythm perception might be um, difficult in other animals with less developed um, auditory motor pathways um, than in humans. But rhythm is present in much more than just our individual engagement with, with music um, or with these timing tasks in the lab. Rhythm is actually very important for interacting with other people. So two of, of the most pervasive rhythmic patterns of organization um, that I'm sure you've heard of are synchrony, when we move in time to another person, and antisynchrony. So this is what ha is happening when you're um, taking turns in a casual dialogue or conversation. Moving in synchrony has been um, famously shown to increase affiliation and trust, and humans have a strong drive to move in sync with other humans. Um, so if you put two humans in, in rocking chairs and you have them interact with each other, even if you rig the game and put weights on one of the rocking chairs, so naturally they wouldn't rock together, um, humans will still have this drive and they'll just adjust so that they're rocking in sync with each other. Um, and moving in synchrony, um, we have this drive so much, uh, it's also could be part of why we enjoy live music at a live music concert, because we're moving in time with the people around us and why we so strongly miss live music during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. So rhythm, um, this organization of events in time, it also organizes our interactions with other people. And we can leverage this organizing feature of rhythm to measure how people coordinate with each other by analyzing their patterns of interactions over time using approaches from dynamical systems. So I'm showing you here um, a picture of a synergy with a blue box that's not supposed to be there yet, you can ignore it. Um, but um, synergies, it's a concept from dynamical systems and they occur, it's a result of micro scale structures in a system interacting to give rise to macro scale dynamics. When a synergy develops, um, we no longer need to describe the independent dynamics of each tiny micro scale structure. We can instead describe the behavior of a single interaction dominant system. And within an individual, this might reflect complementary patterns of the motor system and intentional processes as they pertain to um, that softly assembled complex systems. As researchers, we might track um, the movement of each person's eyes in a crowd and their attention to visual stimuli. And if we think back to that video we saw earlier um, and the crowd that we couldn't see, but we knew were there, um, before they began singing, they were a collection of individuals who happened to be in the same place watching the same events on stage. Within each individual, uh, multiple dynamics on this top box here, uh, multiple dynamics um, from low level neural dynamics to the movement of their eyes and the direction of their attention were coordinated and constrained by the events that were going on on stage. By measuring, um, one of these dynamics, maybe tracking the movement of their eyes, we can attract each individual's attention on stage as the events happened. And we might find that their eye movement behavior is coordinated. So we might find similar patterns of eye movement between everyone in the audience because they're watching and engaging with the same stimulus, but the audience themselves is not coordinating um, with everyone else in the audience. So it's just incidental coordination due to the shared environment and a focus on shared stimuli. What I'm very interested in is the development of an interpersonal synergy. Um, so this happens when the micro scale structures of each interacting system, each person in this case, become coordinated with the micro scale structures of each other. And these dynamics are now constrained not only by the events that are going on on the stage, um, but also by the interactions between the two people um, who are themselves interacting. So back to the audience to make this more concrete. Um, when they began singing together, because that crowd was interacting and they had formed an interpersonal synergy. Um, if I measured behavior from one individual, so if I measured what one of those people in the audience was singing, um, that would actually provide information about the behavior of the crowd as a whole. So that interaction, the act of singing, it imposed a constraint on their behavioral dynamics. Um, and as they created the shared acoustic pattern, singing as members of one coordinated group, um, they formed one single interaction dominant complex system. So that's a lot to say. Um, I'm going to transition into sort of how we use the record of these systems. And
And uh, we have a phone. Perfect. You. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So that, that solved that. Hopefully everybody can still hear me online. Okay. So ideally when we're in the lab and we're, we're measuring whether an interpersonal synergy forms, um, we usually actually do measure a signal from every single person um, that we're studying in a group. And this might be um, a measurement of motion capture. So we're capturing how every person moves and we can use um, motion capture cameras and put physical markers on every person and measure how those markers move in the room. Or we can take computational approaches um, where we make estimates based on video data. Or we might have individual microphones for every single person who's interacting. So we can get an individual acoustic signal from every person. And we do that so we can correlate all these signals together um, to find out whether an interpersonal synergy really did emerge or not. But the real world isn't the lab and the real world can be very messy. And it can be difficult to have individual me measurements on when you're observing the behavior of very large interacting groups of people, say a very massive crowd in the order of thousands of people. It can also be very hard to have a stable camera measurement. So we might not even have video access to capture the movement of the crowd, let alone sophisticated motion capture cameras or hundreds of markers to track every person's head and limb movements. But if we come back now to this audience we've been discussing, you all couldn't see the audience um, in, in the video, um, but you could hear that they weren't interacting at the start. Um, and maybe there was some, some laughing a little bit, but once they really started singing together, you could hear a difference in their patterns of behavior. And they sounded like one coordinated ensemble with um, coming together um, with joint singing, maybe towards a shared goal. Um, and if that's something that we can do, I wondered if the tools that we have in dynamical systems could also detect this same change. So if we just have a single microphone, maybe a set of microphones um, that's very well placed, we can generate a single audio recording of this massive group of people. Um, and we can apply tools from dynamical systems to analyze that signal over time. And I've done this. Um, so next I'm gonna walk you through two experiments, two natural experiments. So these are on, um, the first one is a YouTube video of a performance by a musical ensemble. And I use a musical ensemble as a mo model system for social interaction as a whole for a few reasons. Um, so first of all, a musical performance, it's a naturalistic interaction if you're a musician. And we also know um, the role that each of the musicians play in the ensemble. So if you're looking at a string quartet, you off the violin is often the leader. So you can analyze leader follower dynamics, for instance. Um, but we also have access importantly to a score. So we know exactly what they should be doing when, what notes they should be playing when, because of this musical score that they're playing off of. So this is a unique performance. Um, it's called Welcome to the Imagination World, performed here by the Inugakuen Wind Orchestra. And it actually starts out uncoordinated, kind of like that audience that you could hear, but you couldn't see. Um, and the musicians are instructed to play in an aleatoric style, um, to play randomly, sort of by chance, and they're instructed to try not to coordinate with each other at the start of this song. And then later on, there's a transition um, into the more kind of uh, wind orchestra sound that you would expect from an ensemble performance like that. And of course, I will play this for you. All right, so that's actually the musicians performing the piece. It's not them just warming up on stage. They added some dramatic flair by keeping the lights down low. I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead to when they start sounding more coordinated. Okay, it gets really exciting, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and pause it there. Um, so you can already hear, they weren't very coordinated at the beginning, it sounded really random, but that sounded like music, right? That sounded like what you expect. And my overall research question here is, can we measure uh, differing patterns of coordination um, in a large group by just analyzing the sound pattern that they generate here? 
And I'll take this pattern here and I'm gonna plot it in something called a recurrence plot. This is not from this data set, um, but a recurrence plot, um, it, it can depict um, patterns of repeating behavior over time and you can see structure that happens in a signal. Um, so in these two recurrence plots, um, you see um, dots that are placed when a pattern is repeating over time and you, I've drawn lines that you, I hope you can see little green lines. And they're very, very small right here. We see lots of small green lines and lots of longer green lines over here. Um, these small green lines in the sparse recurrence plot indicates that it's not a very deterministic signal. And these longer lines indicates that that signal is more um, deterministic. And there's another pattern that you also see here that I've um, highlighted on the left over here. And this is a pattern called laminarity. And this is when you see um, patterns of bursts in maybe um, an acoustic signal like this reflected in the plot um, down here. And you can see, uh, we see more of these vertical laminar structure, these kind of box-like shapes um, for these yellow patterns because they repeat more often and the pink patterns don't repeat as much so they don't get um, plotted on this recurrence plot. So um, to the musical data, we have two different recurrence plots that look a little bit like the two recurrence plots that I just showed. Um, so these are from the first 30 seconds of the music and the final 30 seconds of the music. When the music is uncoordinated, we see a very sparse plot. Each individual is acting on their own. Um, they're performing randomly. And this global signal shows less repetition and a less deterministic structure. On the right, when the musicians are interacting and coordinated, um, some of these acoustical patterns occur more frequently and they, they persist for longer durations. They're more deterministic, which is reflected by the structure observed in this recurrence plot. Now that performance was nine minutes long, so you would be right to be skeptical of me just showing you a minute of data. Um, what I have here are I plotted values that you can read off of these recurrence plots, and I plotted them for um, six more 30 second samples in each the coordinated and the uncoordinated condition. And on the bottom, you can see that these dynamics just sort of hover around a single measure. And this is when the musicians are not coordinated. They're not interacting with each other. And at the top of each of these plots, you see um, a lot more diverse range here. So this indicates that when the musicians were uncoordinated, they weren't playing together. Their dynamics hovered around a small subset of, of the possible recurrence dynamics. And when they were coordinated, um, they were able to explore a greater variety of the space um, and actually act as a single interaction dominant complex system. That's really cool. So that's our model system. We've tested this. We're pretty sure our tool works. Um, we can also try this, or what we wanted to do next was try this on a more um, naturalistic setting of a crowd in the wild. And to do this, we contacted some researchers from Brigham Young University who have this data set of crowd sounds from the fan section at a collegiate basketball game. And we applied these same methods of um, recurrence quantification analysis um, to this data. And rather than starting out coordinated and becoming uncoordinated, we had labeled data with a variety of behavior types. Um, so the uh, undergrads, intrepid undergrads, who are the foundation of, of much research work from universities, um, labeled all of these data sets um, based on whether the crowd was acting in applause. Maybe they're clapping, but they're not cheering. Um, maybe they're making distraction noise. Um, like when you're trying to distract the other team before a free throw, um, maybe they're chanting either like negative chants because they're angry at a call from the ref or positive chants trying to cheer on their team, um, like defense or the name of, of the team that they're cheering for. And these are, um, they're not scripted in the sense that the musical score has like strict when to play notes when, um, but there's a little bit of, of a shared social script um, that at least basketball fans would share because they go to many basketball games. So there's certain patterns of behavior that we might expect, um, but the coordination can be a bit more spontaneous, emergent, um, and also directed by the game that we see. Um, so first, before we see recurrent spot, I want to show you an example of two sounds. Um, and you can see um, on the left here, the sound looks a little bit noisy. This is five seconds of data. And on the right, we see a signal with a clear patterns of bursts. We see kind of a repeating loud, soft, soft pattern. And below each of these signals now, we see some familiar recurrence plots. The plot on the left, um, it lacks diagonal lines, which might be indicative of a deterministic structure. And on the right, we see much more structure in the recurrence plot particularly these laminar structures that we looked at before, which reflect burstiness of the signal above. And these five second samples of crowd noise collected through the basketball game. Um, does anyone have an idea of which sounds this might be referring to? 
Marley? Oh yeah, one's probably Chant. <laughs> so one's probably Chant. Yeah, so Marley didn't know which plots I put up here today. She was absolutely right. This one is Chant with all of the structure here. Um, and on the left is distraction noise. And um, my, I can also plot all of these in a similar way where I just take all of those metrics. In this case, I'm plotting the means of all these metrics and all of the types of crowd sounds. And what's important to see here is a kind of um, a trend moving from the noise categories to the chant categories. And my overall interpretation here is maybe there are lots of different individual ways we can make noise to distract the team. And we're not really particularly trying to coordinate with each other. We might be shaking our keys or saying, shouting boo, stomping, and we don't really care what other people are doing. But when we're engaging in these chants um, or anything that's part of the shared social script, engaging in um, this joint speech activity, um, our behavior becomes constrained by the behavior of the individuals around us. And we begin interacting as a single interaction dominant complex system. I'll take my mouse back. Okay, so that brings me um, to the end of the talk, pretty much right on time. So to conclude, we began with a discussion of rhythm and beat perception. We reviewed how the perception of musical rhythm relies on tight auditory motor connections along the dorsal auditory stream in our brain. We tested the role of this pathway in predictive timing mechanisms um, that underlie beat perception by using transcranial magnetic stimulation and EEG and observing changes in these EEG signals before and after stimulation. The regularities that enable us to perceive musical rhythm also enable us to coordinate among small or large groups of people. And um, this engages our cognitive and behavioral processes in multi-scale rhythms of collective interpersonal interaction and the formation of interpersonal synergies. Further, we can actually measure this interpersonal synergy by analyzing how patterns of acoustic behavior um, change together over time. And we can do this just from a single acoustic, global acoustic recording. And these analyses can reveal um, when a group of individuals is actually in, engaging in an interdependent interaction, forming that single complex system. And we have saw this both in a model system of a musical ensemble where we knew what the performance should look like and in a more natural setting um, in a basketball game. Um, with real people interacting in real life in a crowd. And that's the end. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>